What is up, everybody? Welcome back to the Geek Pantheon. I am Eric, and we have another video about one D&D, &D, the big announcement, one of the biggest announcements from the Wizards Presents 2022 conference. And this was the announcement that we are getting an update to 5th edition, a new iteration and evolution of the system. It is unclear to a certain extent what exactly this means, but they have made some things extremely and abundantly clear. Everything that is under the umbrella of 1D&D &D will be backwards compatible with everything 5th edition, starting with the Player's Handbook for 5E, released all those years ago. And none of these things are going to be coming out in an official capacity until 2024. So all the other announcements that we got for like the next year worth of books uh, will not be uh, utilizing these rules, but we have gotten our first unearthed arcana, our first set of playtest material for one D and D and it is character origins. There's additionally an hour long video with Todd Kendrick and uh, Jeremy Crawford sitting there talking about uh, one D and D and the character origins unearthed arcana and what they're excited about and what they hope players take from it. So I watched that video I've read through the PDF and I want to kind of go through and give my thoughts about what they're presenting us with. And I might pepper in some of the insights that we got from Jeremy Crawford in that video as we go through, uh, because there are some very, very interesting changes. So I thought about how I wanted to go through this PDF because we start off with basically, basically what's covered in this PDF is races, backgrounds, languages, um, uh, feats and then a rules glossary. So each of these, I think moving forward are going to have a glossary at the end that give the updated version of the rules if there is anything different. So basically if you see a rule or a condition or anything like that, and there's not an asterisk next to it, it's not included in the rules glossary, then it's just going to use the original player's handbook rules for that uh, aspect of the, the unearthed arcana. So I decided I'm going to start with the rules glossary because I feel like that makes sense because we're going to be referencing things in the rules glossary throughout the rest of the PDF. So it seems silly. I get from a layout standpoint why they put it at the end. It seems silly with me covering it to wait until the end to be like, and here's what all of that meant. So I'm going to get into it. So first off with the rules glossary, we start off um, with and I'll cover that. So they're basically changing the way spell lists work. So right now, spell lists are based off of class. And so when you take a feat like magic initiate, you have to pick bard, warlock, wizard, sorcerer, yada, yada, yada. They're simplifying that in a major way. So the first thing in the rules glossary is arcane spells, that term. And that works in conjunction with some things coming later that I'll just cover now of divine spells and primal spells. Arcane spells are their own list and bards, sorcerer, warlocks, and wizards will utilize, and artificers will utilize arcane spells. And then Jeremy Crawford mentioned in the video that some classes will also get, like the warlock uh, might be able to take a class feature that gives them access to some divine spells or some primal spells and same with like an artificer. But the base class structure is you have your more arcane classes that I just listed on the arcane spell, and then your more divine spellcasters like clerics and paladins on the um, divine spell list, and then for the primal spell list like druids, rangers, etc., pulling from the primal spell list. Um, and Jeremy Crawford gets into like from a design standpoint what they're thinking that like arcane is kind of the the multiverse um, type of magic. Divine are the upper planes, primal are the lower planes, that kind of thing. But that's the big change. We're doing away with class spell lists and we're just breaking them down by magic type. And then class features will dictate if you get to dip into other spell lists when you're playing that spell. I like this change. This is very indicative to me of Genesis, the system that we use for currently for my actual play podcast that I'm the GM for Eberron Renewed, where... Uh, they, it's a classless system, so they just have arcane, divine, primal as the magic uh, skills, and you just take ranks in that, and that dictates what kind of spells you can you can utilize. So, 
I think this is fine. I think it's going to be great from a simplicity standpoint because like Jeremy Crawford said, when they're talking about class features or new feats, stuff like that, they can just say you gain access to the arcane spell list or you gain access to the divine spell list. You gain access to one first level spell from the divine spell list as opposed to saying paladin spell list, cleric spell. Oh, I don't think paladin said you get what I'm saying. Cleric spell list, wizard spell list, sorcerer spell list. This makes it easier and simpler. Um, artisans tools. Uh, the, I'll also kind of cover, they, they touch on artisans tools, gaming sets and musical instruments. Nothing really changes about these. They still have the same proficiencies. The cost has changed. So like artisan tools all cost 15 gold pieces. Now, the reason they're doing this is to level out the backgrounds, the pre-made kits that you get from backgrounds. There were some cost discrepancies. So they just made everything 50 gold pieces across the board, every background, every pre-made background, the equipment kit that you get worth 50 gold pieces so that you're, you're not hindered if you decide to make your own background and just get 50 gold pieces to start with, you're not ending up better or worse than other backgrounds. Um, creature types, none of these have changed that I'm aware of. Aberration, beast, celestial, construct, dragon, elemental, fey, fiend, giant, humanoid, monstrosity, ooze, plant, and undead are the, um, are the creature types listed in the glossary. I was really hoping to see Outsider. That's a creature type that I think 5th edition is really missing, and I loved the Outsider creature type. Um, so I was sad to not see that. But an important thing just kind of tucked in the creature type rules glossary entry is it references, for the example, the description of Cure Wounds specifies that the spell doesn't benefit a construct. That is huge because... Back in an Unearthed Arcana in the past, when they were doing the lineages and they had the Dampier and the Rewoken, I think, um, but the Dampier was going to be undead a and humanoid. It was, it was a weird thing that they were doing like double dipping, but I was against that because having an undead player character race screws everything up because rules as written currently cure wounds does not benefit undead creatures. That's no longer the case. Well, as of right now in this playtest material, at least according to this little like example given is cure wounds does not benefit constructs. So maybe we'll see a player race that's undead and they've made this modification so that an undead player is not at a huge disadvantage amongst the rest of the player characters and having to go out of their way to find a different type of healing. Constructs have mending as a spell that heals them. Uh, and they did away with like the positive energy, negative energy that they had in 3.5 that also kind of worked where like inflict wounds healed undead creatures. That's no longer a thing. So I, I like this change if it's what I think it is. Um, okay. Big, big one, kind of a big one. Well, so D20 tests is the next rules glossary entry. So the term D20 test encompasses the three main D20 rules of the game, ability check, attack roll, and saving throw. If something affects a D20 test, it affects all three of these roles. I like having a general catch all term for that. D20 test is a little clumsy, but I don't hate it. Um, but anyway, um, it does give some classification for setting a DC, the DM determining, um, the target number for a D20 test it does say nothing lower than five or greater than 30. When a DM is setting a D20 test target number, also not using the term DC might be reading more into that than I need to. Okay. They finally did it. They codified it. Rolling a one on any D20 test is an automatic failure. Rolling a 20 on any D20 test is an automatic success. So I that's how I've always played it at my tables, but now it's in the rules. And Jeremy Crawford talks about the fact that this is the way people, a lot of people play the game. So we're just bringing the rules in line with the way typically people play. So saving throw, roll a natural 20, automatically succeed, regardless of what the DC for the, uh, the saving throw was. Same with a natural one. Um, the only thing that, and this is up to DM discretion, obviously having it say, um, 
like it, it does say rolling a 20 doesn't bypass limitations on the test such as range or line of sight the 20 bypasses only bonuses and penalties to the roll so because i could see this getting some players real excited that you know uh, I I perform a charisma check to convince the king to give me his crown. Well, I rolled a natural twenty, so I succeed. It's still the purview of the DM to set the the success conditions. Like, yes, you succeeded. The king is charmed by your insolence and doesn't throw you into the dungeon. Does not mean you get what you wanted. Just you got the best case scenario of the check. So that's an important thing that I'm worried that people are going to be like, oh, I rolled a 20 on a, on the check, so I get everything that I could ever want. So that's an important thing, but they have codified that. Okay. <laughs> Critical hits are changing in a massive, massive way. I'm just going to read the description that they have in the rules glossary for those of you that haven't read it. Weapons and unarmed strikes have a special feature for player characters. Critical hits. Weapons and unarmed strikes. Spells can no longer critically hit. Eldritch Blast can no longer critically hit. Um, yeah, uh, that's huge. I I get it and I don't get it. Um, and here's here's why. Well, the, the intention was, you know, I think making martial characters feel special, giving them a thing that is truly special. Additionally, Spellcasters, I gesture to myself because I'm playing a spellcaster in Kyber Shards, our actual play over on the Laughing Tree uh, channel. Um, casters can upcast with higher spell slots. Now, I'm playing a warlock, so all of my spells just get beefed up. Martial characters don't have that option. So spellcasters can always roll additional dice on their... Um, on their um, attacks. That's the word I'm looking for. On their attacks. Whereas you can't upcast with a sword. You can get extra attack, but you have to roll each time. And so you're not guaranteed that you're going to hit every time. And same with cantrips, like Eldritch Blast. Once you hit fifth level, you're now rolling two dice instead of just one. And you're not having to um, roll at each individual time. I guess Eldritch Blast is a bad example because you get two beams but some cantrips you know you just they get more powerful um so i will say that i i understand it i'm i'm eager to get it at the table to see how it feels additionally the other half of that weapons and unarmed strikes have a special feature for player characters monsters can no longer critically hit jeremy crawford did spend a quite a bit of time explaining this decision as well and i understand it and i get it a bit more than the casters not getting critical hits. So the the idea with the critical hit is you have this like chance of like having a massive damage spike potentially if the dice go well. Um and and that's always exciting. There's always that that chance that it might happen in any, ever, any moment. Well, from a monster design standpoint, DMs have something like that. It's recharge abilities. A dragon's breath weapon is a dragon's critical hit because you don't know if it's going to recharge and you're still rolling dice to see if it recharges every round you get to roll to see if you get this massive thing back and you get you get it out of the gate one time so that is the intention with a monster design standpoint is that these these recharge actions and these massive uh, legendary reactions and things like that those are your critical hits as a dungeon master and you're in control of when they happen you can hold back a couple rounds and then boom hit them or you can come out of the gate guns blazing so i i get i get it i guess that's all i'll say is i understand it i imagine it's going to be very controversial uh on both sides of casters and dms being unhappy that critical hits are being taken away from them but give it a shot because I think it could work well. Um, and then it goes on to further clarify that, you know, the attack is a critical hit when you roll a natural 20. You roll the damage die of the weapon or the unarmed strike a second time and add the second roll as extra damage to the attack. Further clarifying, you're not doubling the whole damage. If a mace deals 1d6 plus your strength modifier, a critical hit with a mace deals 2d6 plus your strength modifier. Um, if it does not roll dice, like if you're just doing your unarmed strike 
a base where it's one plus your strength modifier, then you don't it, you can't critically hit with it because you're not rolling dice. So you can't roll an extra die of no dice. Okay, and the next in the rules class where we get the divine spells and the gaming sets, which I've already covered. Uh, next, the grappled condition is changing. So what the grappled condition was currently, or is currently, uh, Grapple creature speed becomes zero and it can't benefit from any bonus to its speed. The condition ends if the grappler is incapacitated. The condition also ends if an effect removes the grapple creature from the reach of the grappler or the grappling effect, such as a creature being hurled away from uh, by the thunder wave spell. In one D&D, um, speed is zero and cannot change. So that just kind of different language, but same thing. You have disadvantage on attack rolls against any target other than the grappler. I love this. I love this idea of like the it, it makes grappling more strategic because you're not just locking somebody down, but you're also making it more difficult for them to attack another creature. Uh, so I, I really like that. And I think that is good. I think that's a smart thing to do. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, movable. The grappler can drag or carry you, but the grappler suffers from the slowed, co slowed condition. We'll get there while moving unless you are tiny or too or more sizes smaller than the grappler, then it can move normally. So if a huge creature grabs you, then you can move around freely. And then escape. While grappled, you can make a dexterity or strength saving throw against the grapple's escape DC. Not a not an opposed check. Escape DC. At the end of each of your turns, the ending the condition on yourself. The condition also ends if the grappler is incapacitated or something moves you outside the grapple's range without using your speed. So those things are the same. So the big changes are movable, where it specifically says that the grappler can move you about freely, but they are slowed and having disadvantage on attacks except against the grappler. Um, and so, yeah, uh, I, I like these changes. I think it makes grappling a more dynamic and strategically viable thing to do because you're not just stopping something from moving. And I'm, I know that I've played it before where I've said, yes, you can move a grappled creature around, but having it codified in the rules this way, really good. Uh, incapacitated condition. Uh, inactive, you can't take reactions or reactions. No concentration. Your concentration is broken. Speechless, you can't speak. Surprised, if you are incapacitated when you roll initiative, you have disadvantage on the roll. Um, this is just the, the, the surprised thing is a new aspect i feel like the other two the no concentration and <laughs> speechless are just putting into rules something that's very obvious but those players are gonna be like well it doesn't say in the rules that i can't concentrate while incapacitated uh even though yeah i mean you're incapacitated though so these additional things make a lot of sense for me and they shore up the condition as a whole and then yeah uh being having disadvantage on initiative checks while you're incapacitated is kind of funny to me and makes sense. Okay. Big change. Inspiration is changing fundamentally. They've realized that people aren't using it <laughs> as much as they had hoped. And it's way too nebulous of a thing, especially earning it. Earning it is way too nebulous. Uh, it's on the DM to remember to give out inspiration. So, Gaining inspiration. The main way a character gains inspiration is by rolling a natural 20 on a d20 test. Every time you roll a nat 20, you gain inspiration because you've inspired yourself. You did really awesome on this thing and you are more motivated to do well on further things. Uh, the DM can also award inspiration to a character who's done something particularly heroic or amusing. So that is staying the same. DMs can still dole it out as they want, but there is a codified way that players can earn it. Great. Additionally... You can only have, or you can never have more than one instance of inspiration. Um, so you still, it's one and done, which I, I get, but there, the next aspect of this, I think would lessen the sting of removing the one inspiration cap. So, um, if something gives you inspiration though, this is good. If something gives you inspiration, you already have it. You can give that inspiration to a player character in your group who lacks it. That's great. That, that's a great fallback plan because I've had times on, on Kyber Shards, in fact, where Philip has wanted to give me inspiration. I haven't used inspiration. So, well, then you can't have inspiration. Uh, so having it codifying the rules of like, aha, I do, but they don't. So they get it, uh, which is great. It, it's a it's a group resource 
that can benefit everyone uh, by a certain player being particularly funny or heroic. Uh, and then losing inspiration. If you still have inspiration when you start a long rest, you lose it. So you, you don't hold on to it session after session after session. Once you do a long rest, you're done, uh, which will make sense here in a bit once we get to some other things. Um, long rest, only thing that's really changing is um, it specifically states that if a creature has a long rest interrupted, but they've already completed an hour of that long rest, so if, if the party was sleeping and halfway through they get ambushed, they still gain the benefits of a short rest. So they could st still spend hit dice. If they're a warlock, they get their spell slots back, all that kind of stuff. So I, yeah, I like that codifying that. Other than that, I don't think anything huge is changing uh, in terms of the benefits. You still regain all lost hit points, regain spent hit dice up to half the creature's total number of them. They're doing musical, musical instruments, which I've already covered under the artisan tools and gaming sets and um, primal spells, which is the final type of spell, arcane, divine, primal. Um, and now the slowed condition. So this one is uh, a brand new condition to the game limited movement you must spend one extra foot of movement for every foot you move using your speed attack rolls against you have advantage and dexterity saves are affected you have disadvantage on de dexterity saving throws while you are slowed now an important thing to acknowledge is the grappling condition because the, it talks about the grappler um the grappler only suffers the slowed condition while moving. So if somebody's grappled you, they are not slowed entirely. Uh, so you don't have advantage on attack rolls against them unless you're attacking them while they're moving, which I don't think that would be possible, but I don't know all the rules yet. <laughs> but uh, insofar as I can tell, that is how those two things work in conjunction with each other. But we have a brand new condition. I'm sure there will be spells out there. And I love... Um, having something other than restrained to do some crowd control and keep uh, creatures from moving about freely, trying to slow enemies down from getting away. Um, tool proficiencies. Okay, so something that I think is new with the tool proficiencies and why it's included in the rules glossary is if, let's say, I'm proficient in disguise kit, uh, with a disguise kit and with deception, if I am making a deception check, while having utilized my disguise chick and I'm proficient disguise, disguise kit and I'm proficient in both, I get advantage on that check because I, I have double proficiency. Uh, so I can benefit from having a skill proficiency and a tool proficiency that's related to the same check. I think that's a brand new thing. I like that. I, I think it makes sense because it would be kind of a bummer if I had proficiency in both. And it's just like, well, that sucks because I, I feel like I should maybe get expertise or something. So advantage is good. Um, Tremor Sense uh, is in the next in the rules, um, the rules glossary. And it just, I, I, I double checked these. And um, I think the only thing that's added to the Tremor Sense rules is that Tremor Sense doesn't count as a form of sight. So something like blinded wouldn't affect Tremor Sense. Once again, one of those things that logically is obvious, but some players. Um, unarmed Strike is uh, hugely different. So basically, when you make an Unarmed Strike, uh, you do your Strength modifier plus your Proficiency bonus. On a hit, you pick one of the following effects. Either Damage, you deal Bludgeoning Damage, one plus your Strength modifier. Uh, grapple or Shove. Rules for these are the same. But they are now, rather than taking the attack action to grapple or shove, it's all under unarmed strike. And when you land with an unarmed strike, you can then choose if you want to hit, grapple, or shove. Um, not a huge difference. And I don't think this is something that was really super necessary, but I, I once again can understand it. Um, and then we have a breakdown of the spell list. I'm not going to go through which spells are arcane, divine, or primal, just because that would be me reading a lot of spells. It only covers cantrips and first level spells, specifically because when we get into the feat, we have the magic initiate feat, which you pick cantrips and first level spells. So it was necessary for them to have this reference. Um, but I bet you could guess on a lot of these like that guidance is a divine spell or 
animal friendship is primal. So you all are smart or the PDF is on the internet and you can go check out the list if you want, but I'm not going to read the whole thing. Okay. Character origins, top of the document. We're kicking off with determining your origin, which is where you pick your race, your background and a language. So humans is the first race that we are presented with. There's some flavor and stuff. We're just going to stick with the, the crunchy bits right now. Just discussing them. The flavor it it's pretty bog standard is what you'd expect. So humans, uh, they are humanoid size, medium or small. Cause as Jeremy Crawford put it in the video, there are people who fall between two and four feet tall and they should be allowed to be represented in the game. Don't say that they're dwarves. Dwarves are a se separate race that are fantasy. Don't say they're halflings. That's a horrible thing to say. There are people that are that size. They're represented in the game now. Love that. Um, speed 30 feet, lifespan 80 years on average. As a human, you gain three special traits. Resourceful, you gain inspiration whenever you finish long rest. So if you're a human, when you wake up, you're inspired. So you see what they've done with inspiration is if you're a human, you're never going to be afraid to use it because every time you wake up, you're going to have it again. And you might get it further when you roll a d20 and land on a 20. So... I like that they're making inspiration a more plentiful resource and it's more readily available. Skillful, you gain proficiency in one skill of your choice. Makes sense. Versatile, you gain the skilled feat or another first level feat of your choice. So essentially variant human is just human now. Um, and then we get a bit more of flavor text. Ardlings. These are a brand new race. They are supernatural beings who are either born in the upper plains or have one or more ancestors who originated there. They're like Azamar's cousins, but they're animal based. So you have three different types, exalted, heavenly, or idyllic. Uh, the Ardling traits, they are humanoid. Once again, they can be either medium or small. Speed 30 feet, lifespan 200 years on average. Ardlings gain the special trait angelic flight as a bonus action. So there is, it does come into the action economy as a bonus action. You sprout spectral ring wings for a moment and fly up to a number of feet equal to your speed. If you are in the air at the end of this movement, you fall if nothing is holding you aloft. You can use this bonus action a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses when you finish a long rest. I am always leery of flight <laughs> at first level. I've never personally had a had it come up as an issue at my table, but I've heard from plenty of people that it just it can get wonky. I think they did a good job of trying to limit it. They don't just have a fly speed out of the gate. It's, you know, a bonus action only a couple times per day starting out, and it's only your base speed and you have to land at the end of it or else you fall. So I think they did a good job of mitigating it as much as they could. But once again, I'm always iffy with flight at first level. Um, and additionally, you pick your celestial legacy. So that's the exalted, the heavenly, or the, the idyllic. Um, so Ardlings are humanoids, but they have animal heads and uh, animal faces. And so uh, you could, based on your legacy, like exalted, the suggested animals are cat, eagle, goat, mule, heavenly, elephant, owl, pig, stork, and idyllic bear, dog, raven, toad. That's the aesthetics of it mechanically you get a first level spell and then at third level and fifth level you gain additional spells huge change to these types of things though uh the the racial traits that get you access to spells so like i said first level you gain a cantrip and then um third and fifth level you gain spells uh so exalted uh, thaumaturgy, divine favor, lesser restoration, heavenly, light, cure wounds, zone of truth, idyllic, guidance, healing word, animal messenger. Um, the third and fifth level, uh, when you gain those spells, you gain the ability to cast the a higher level spell with this trait. So you get to cast it for free. And you can't cast it again until you finish the long rest. However, you can cast the spell using any spell slots you have at the of the appropriate level which means if i'm playing an ardling a heavenly ardling at third level i get cure wounds regardless of the class that i'm playing and i get to upcast it if i have higher level spell slots if i'm playing a warlock 
cure wounds after I've I've used it as a third level spell using this trait. But let's say I'm an eighth level warlock, or let's say I'm a fifteenth level warlock, just to make sure that it's a higher spell slot. I play a warlock in real life, and it takes so long for those spells to go up. Um, <laughs> Uh, 15th level warlock. Well, I can then cast cure wounds using one of my spell slots, and all of a sudden I'm healing for a crap ton of damage or of of healing, crap ton of dice healing. So they've added that to where these spells also kind of reside on your spell list, and you can cast them using any spell slot you want after you've used the initial version of it with the trait. Love that. Um, and then you get to pick intelligence, wisdom, or charisma when you select your legacy, and then. You have resistance to radiant damage. Uh, next up is Dragonborn. Still a humanoid, medium, 30 feet, 80 years on average. Um, one thing I will go back up to the top. It does reference because you're going to see as we go through this, there are no half elves and there are no half orcs listed on this list because they basically do the children of different humanoid kinds is what the, the title of the section is. They leave that up to you. So if you want to do a half orc, half elf, you can. Uh, basically, the way you do it is you pick the two race options that are humanoid to represent your parents. Then you determine which of those race options provide your game traits, size, speed, special traits. Then mix and match your visual characteristics um, however you want. And finally, determine the average of the two options uh, lifespan traits to figure out how long your character might live. So the example is a child of a halfling and a gnome has an average lifespan of 288 years. So if I were to do a human and an ardling, then I could do the celestial legacy uh, and the versatile where I get an additional feat and resourceful. So I get the celestial legacy. I get the cool spells. I get to look, I could say that I look really cool. I get my animal look, but I still get inspiration when I finish long rest and I get an additional feat or the skilled feat if I want that when I'm creating this character. Um, so you can mix and match. And I, I love customization options. I like, I like freedom with my gaming. Uh, I, the, and this, this is just freedom. It's just opening things up for you. Something else you all may note is I have not once mentioned racial ability score traits. We'll get there. Just give me a second. Um, Dragonborn, humanoid, medium, 30 feet, every 80 years on average. Breath weapons are all 15 foot cones. Uh, they're still based on the dragon type. So black, acid, blue, lightning, etc. cetera. Um, you can use the number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses uh, at the end of a long rest. You gain damage resistance to your ancestry type, dark vision and draconic language. You get to speak draconic out of the gate. Everybody speaks common also, just straight out of the gate. Um, dwarf, uh, dwarves, humanoid, medium, 30 feet, 350 years on average, dark vision, dwarven resilience, resistance, points and damage. You also have advantage on saving throws you made to avoid or end the poison condition on yourself. Dwarven toughness, your hit point maximum increases by one and it increases by one again whenever you gain a level. So you essentially have an additional plus one to your constitution modifier, uh, forge wise. Your divine creator gave you an uncanny affinity for working with stone or metal. You gain tool proficiency with two of the following options of your choice, jewelers, masons, smiths, or tinkers tools. Here's the big new one, stone cunning. As a bonus action, this is why it was in the rules glossary, you gain tremor sense with a range of 60 feet for 10 minutes. You must be on a stone surface or touching such a surface to use this tremor sense. The stone can be natural or worked. So if you're just in a city on stone roads, you can use Tremor Sense. Uh, you can use this ability a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. You gain all expended uses at the end of a long rest. It's so cool. Something else you will note. No sub races. None. Um, the, you, because you get like the legacy choices. So like the Ardling with an old development mindset would have been you know, the exalted, the heavenly and Dilk would be sub races and you would have a whole other thing. Now it's just, you just pick one. It's like the dragon board. Just pick one. We don't have to list out every, t every option. Elves, humanoid, medium, 30 feet, 750 years on average. Um, dark vision, elven lineage, where you pick drow, high elf or wood elf. We'll get into what you get there, but it works the exact same way as the celestial legacy for the Ardling where, um, 
you gain additional spells at third and fifth level and you can cast them using spell slots in addition to using them with the trait Fey ancestry you have advantage on saving throws you make to avoid or in the charmed condition on yourself keen senses proficiency in perception and trance you only need four hours to complete a long rest and you retain consciousness okay elven lineages you gain a special uh racial trait at first level uh, rather than a cantrip like with the Ardling. So Drow, range of your dark vision increases to 120 feet. You also know the Dancing Lights cantrip. Then you gain Fairy Fire and Darkness. Uh, High Elf, you know press digitation. Whenever you finish Long Rest, you can replace that cantrip with a different cantrip from the Arcane Spell List. That's one of the reasons why I love how simple it is. Arcane Spell List. All those spells. All those cantrips are at your fingertips. Uh, and then you gain Detect Magic and Misty Step. Uh, Wood Elf, your speed increases by 35 to 35 feet, not by 35 feet. You also know the Druid Craft, Cantrip, and then Long Strider and Pass Without Trace. Gnomes, Humanoids, Small, 30 feet, 425 years, Dark Vision, Gnomish Cunning, Advantage on Intelligence, Wisdom, and Charisma Saving Throws. Gnomish Lineage, once again, uh, you get a special ability uh, based on picking Forest Gnome or Rock Gnome. Uh, and you pick Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma when you pick these. Forest Gnome, you know the Minor Illusion Cantrip. You can also cast Speak with Animals with this trait. You can cast it with a uh, with the trait a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus. Regain when you finish Long Rest. You can also use any spell slots you have to cast this spell. And Rock Gnome Game Mending and Prestidigitation Cantrips. In addition, I love this. So this is uh, slightly different than what the Rock Gnome currently gets. So they can spend 10 minutes casting Prestidigitation and create a tiny clockwork device like the current Rock Gnome, but it can do anything that Prestidigitation could do. You have to pick which function of Prestidigitation. So it talks about how the cantrip can create or extinguish fire. You have to pick which one. Does it create fire? Does it extinguish it? Uh, because it can't do both but i love that that you get the you can create these tools these tiny little toys and trinkets and and whatnot um and uh, it takes a bonus action to touch the device and activate it and um you can have three such devices in existence at a time and each one dismantles itself after eight hours and you gain the components back at the end because it costs 10 gold pieces worth of components you can recover those at the end so yeah, I, I like that. That's that's a nice little tweak to the existing uh, system. Halflings, humanoid, small, 30 feet, 150 years on average. They are brave. They have advantage on saving throws you make to avoid or in the frightened condition. Uh, you can move through the space of halfling nimbleness. You can move through the space of any creature that is of a size larger than yours, but you can't stop there. Luck, when you roll a one on a d20 of a d20 test, you can re-roll the die and you must use the new roll. And naturally stealth, you have proficiency in stealth. Uh, the stealth skill orc not half orc just orc humanoid medium 30 feet 80 years you can take the dash action adrenaline rush this is such a cool ability i love this you can take the dash action as a bonus action when you do so you gain a number of temporary hit points equal to your proficiency bonus you can just trade a number of times equal to your proficiency bonus and you regain all expended uses at the end of a long rest uh, dark vision, powerful build. You can have one size larger when determining your carrying capacity and the weight you can push, drag, or lift. Uh, relentless endurance, when you are reduced to zero hit points but not killed outright, you can drop to one hit point instead. Once you use this trait, you can do so again until you finish long rest. What I So why I like this system is for half orcs, there are so many different... I mean, you have four different racial traits of the half orc and i believe you have three racial traits of the human if i'm not mistaken um so you have so many different options that you can play with so many different types of half orcs that you can you can you can pick from you, you like not every half orc is the same like from a racial standpoint there's diversity amongst half orcs amongst half elves amongst half halflings and um i i like that i think that is great not just from a messaging standpoint but also from a mechanic standpoint being able to have a half orc that is prime like 
airs more on the human side and so they have the additional feet and the uh, inspiration uh but they just have dark vision that that's all that they really got from their orc side is is the dark vision that's it uh that's that's fine like you'd have a human with dark vision holy crap um or you could have a half orc that airs very much more towards the orcish racial traits with the adrenaline rush and the powerful build um and and maybe they just uh have the 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 additional skill that they get they're a little bit more versatile than your average orc because they're their human ancestry so i i really like this i feel like people need to give this a shot because i think it it opens things up it gives players more freedom which i like as a player and as a dm and then tieflings abyssal chthonic and infernal are the three types of tieflings so tiefling traits humanoid medium or small jeremy crawford talked about why small tieflings because so many demonic entities are small like iconically and so letting you play as a small tiefling and kind of that impish type character just made a lot of sense so I like that 30 feet 100 year lifespan on average dark vision fiendish legacy like the other ones we'll get into it um and otherworldly presence you know the thaumaturgy can trip when you cast it uh, the spell uses the same spell casting ability used for your fiendish uh, legacy trait. Okay, Abyssal. You have resistance to poison damage and the poison spray can trip. You get ray of sickness and hold person. Chthonic, you have resistance to necrotic and you gain the chill touch. And then you get false life and rave enfeeblement. Infernal, resistance to fire damage. You gain the firebolt can trip and you get hellish rebuke and darkness. Once again, you can upcast hellish rebuke as a tiefling now which is something they specifically call in that, in that video. And I love that. That's yeah. Um, okay. And that is all of the races. <laughs> this is going to be, uh, I mean, we're about to get into backgrounds and feats. Uh, I know this is a longer video, but this is a big document. I mean, it's 21 pages, so we're going to press on. Remember how I said that we didn't talk about racial ability modifiers anywhere throughout all of those races. It's because they are in backgrounds which makes too much sense. Like the fact that you were a soldier should have more effect on your abilities than what race you were born. Uh, the fact that you were a sailor or a criminal or like those should affect your abilities. And yeah, this is such an elegant uh, solution that wizards come up with and I applaud them for it because it makes so much sense. Additionally, they flip the script on backgrounds in the player's handbook. They provide you with all these different backgrounds. And then at the end say, if you want to make your own background, here are the rules to do that. Well, now instead they're starting with, here's how you build your background. And then if you just want some easy to pick from options, here you go. So the way you build a background, you determine your character's ability scores. You choose two of them, increase one by two and one by one, or you can select three and increase each by one. That's what we've seen in Tasha's and uh, the uh, Monsters of the Multiverse book uh, up to this point. Skill proficiencies. Choose two skills. Your characters gain proficiency in them. Tool proficiency. Choose one tool. You gain tool proficiency with it. And language. Choose one language from the standard and rare language tables. Your character knows that language. So you get to pick one language from either the standard or rare languages table. I'm just going to cover a couple of the examples. I'm not going to go through every background just because it's not necessary. I think you all understand. But for the Acolyte, plus two wisdom, plus one intelligence, you gain insight in religion, calligrapher supplies, celestial. Um, oh, I forgot one thing. Sorry. Two things, actually. You also gain a feat. You gain a, a first level's feat. I said first level feet. That's right. Feats are leveled. Um, and uh, yeah, I I really like a leveled feat system because you can create prerequisites. You can create feet trees. And I really like that kind of thing. So it seems like we're going in that direction. So choose one first level feat. Your character gains that feat. And 50 gold pieces to spend on starting equipment. And you keep any unspent gold pieces as spare coin. So language celestial for the acolyte. Feet, magic initiate, divine. And then you have your equipment, prayer book, parchment, calligrapher supplies, robe, holy symbol, and three gold pieces left over. Uh, just scrolling down, entertainer. Two charisma, one dexterity, acrobats performance, musical instrument of your choice, the elvish, the feet musician. That's a brand new feat. We'll get into it. Um, and equipment. 
Uh, so you get the idea. Guard, plus two strength, plus one wisdom. Athletics, perception, gaming set, dwarvish. Alert is the feat. So if you have any questions, let me know down below. But I feel like the, the background system is pretty obvious. I like that they're putting more emphasis on backgrounds being an informed aspect of your character's abilities as they currently exist. Races inform your biological traits. You have dark vision because of your your race. You're not inherently stronger than everyone else because of your race. So I, I do like that. I know it's controversial, and I'm sure I'll hear it down in the comments, how it's ruining the game <laughs> and making all the races the same. But I feel like I just went through all the races and how incredibly different they all are. So if you're saying that removing the plus two and plus one from the races makes them all the same, we're not reading the same rules or playing the same game because they're clearly very distinct. Um, so that's just that's just my take on it. And if you disagree, oh well, moving on. <laughs> Starting languages. Um, so you have for your stand, so you always start with three languages. Common, the language provided by your background, and then you get to pick one additional language from the standard language table below. So the only way you get to know a rare language is from your background. Standard language is what you get to pick at the very end. Um, so common, common sign language, Dwarvish, Elvish, Giant, Gnomish, Goblin, Halfling, and Orc are the standard languages. Rare languages, Abyssal, Celestial, Deep Speech, Draconic, Druidic, Infernal, Primordial, Sylvan, Thieves, Canton, Undercommon. Another controversial thing that I imagine is going to come up after I read that list. When you're creating your background, you can pick Druidic and you can pick Thieves Cant. And I love it. Because let's say I want to play a character who maybe as a kid was a street thief. Like my background is criminal, let's say, or urchin. Um, and I want that to be reflected in my background, but I'm not playing a rogue. I'm playing... Um, a but a druid or a sorcerer or an artificer like an artificer is great like i'm trying to get out of that life i'm trying to tinker i'm trying to build things i don't want to steal anymore but i was in that life for a long time and yeah i can still understand thieves can't absolutely i can i learned it i lived off of it why wouldn't i still know it Maybe I grew up in a druidic circle. Maybe I was raised and my parents were druids and I decided I didn't want to be a part of that life. I didn't want to do that. I wanted to go off to the big city and make my way as a bard. But, you know, I was taught druidic since I was three years old. Like, I know druidic. So I, I like it. I like it. I like it. That's all I'm going to say. I like I like including druidic and thieves can't in the languages that you can know as part of your background. Okay. <clears throat> Feats. So um, uh, there's not a ton of feats, so I'm going to go through them because they are different. They did change the feats. Something they talked about with uh, creating the feats is they wanted to make the feats appealing to people that it made sense. So the healer feat was the one that they specifically called out in the video. If you're making a life cleric and you see the healer feat just as a heading, you're like, oh, I want to be a healer. I'm going to take that. But there's not really anything for you if you can already heal people. The healer feat was for people who couldn't heal people that wanted to be able to heal people. So what they've done is they made the healer feat appealing to both people that can't heal and people that can. They, they've they tried to thread that needle. So alert. Alert is a feat that already exists, but this is very different. Uh, first level, no prerequisite. It's not repeatable. What repeatable means is if the feat is repeatable, you can take it more than once uh, to regain that. And we'll get into it in here in a second. Initiative proficiency. When you roll initiative, you gain proficiency on that roll. And then initiative swap. Immediately after you roll initiative, you can swap your initiative with the initiative of one willing ally in the same combat. You cannot make the swap if you or the ally is incapacitated. Yeah, I, I dig this. I love it. I love initiative manipulation. Um, one thing that I've never really liked about d d is the fixed initiative system. And this is a little something to make it a little bit better. The crafter feat is a first level feat. No prerequisite, non-repeatable. You're adept at crafting things and bargaining with merchants, granting you the following benefits. Tool proficiency. You gain tool proficiency with three different artisan tools of your choice. And you gain a discount when you buy a non-magical item. You receive a 20% discount on it. 
and when you craft an item using a tool with which you have tool proficiency, uh, the required crafting time is reduced by 20%. So this is obviously a version of the skilled feat. And Jeremy Crawford once again talked about this in the video that they wanted to take something like the skilled feat and make it a bit more, make it a bit more flavorful for the specific type of skills that you're gaining. So obviously with crafter, you're talking about tool proficiencies with artisan tools, and then you get some additional stuff of a discount and a reduction in time to craft things. Uh, healer, first level, no prereq, non-repeatable. Um, battle medic, if you have a healer's kit, you can expend one use of it to ten and tend to a creature within five feet of you as an action. That creature can expend one of its hit dice and you then roll that die. The creature regains a number of hit points equal to the roll plus your proficiency bonus. So you can just outright heal people. They don't have to be conscious for you to do this. So you can get people up on their feet if they've been knocked. And then healing rerolls. Whenever you roll a die to determine the number of hit points you restore with a spell or with this feat's battle medic benefit, you can re-roll the die. If its roll is a one, you must use the new roll. So that's where the life clerics get a bit of a bonus. Lucky, non-repeatable, no prereq. Uh, luck points, you get a number of luck points equal to your proficiency bonus. It's not just a flat three anymore. You only start with two, but you can get a lot more as you go on. Other than that, it's largely the same. You can spend points um, to immediately after you roll a d20 for a d20 test. You can spend one luck point to give yourself advantage on the roll. When a creature rolls a d20 for an attack roll against you, you can spend one luck point to impose disadvantage on that roll. Magic Initiate. Uh, no prerequisite. and But this one is repeatable, but you must choose a different spell list each time. So you can't just do Arcana, Arcana, Arcana. You have to do Arcane, Primal, Divine. So you can do it three times. Uh, but you gain two cantrips from the spell list and one first level spell. Uh, you always have that spell prepared. You can cast it once without using a spell slot. That is also new for the magic initiate. Uh, once without a spell slot um, and you once per long rest. But then you can also cast it using any spell slots that you have. Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma. You choose when you select this feat. Um, and whenever you, regain, you gain a new level, you can replace one of the spells you chose for this feat with a different spell of the same level from your chosen spell list. So a bit more versatility there. Musician, this is just like crafter where you get uh, three musical instrument proficiencies, but then inspiring song. As you finish a short or long rest, you can play a song and a musical instrument with which you have tool proficiency and give inspiration to allies who hear the song. The number of allies you can affect this way equals your proficiency bonus. So you start out with only two, grows over time, but this is great like because it, they, they once again talk about this in the video, like a bard would want to take the musician feat or could want to because it's not just layering on something they already have. This is something additional where just as part of a long or short rest, it's not even an additional action. You can just say, yeah, I play a song. I give you and you inspiration, not you because you're a human. So you're going to get it at the end of the long rest anyway. Um, so, yeah, this is great. Savage Attacker, when you take the attack action and hit a target with a weapon as part of that action, you can reroll the weapon's damage die twice. Uh, you can roll the weapon's damage die twice and use either roll against the target. You can only use this benefit once per turn. This is largely the same. The wording is a little bit different. Skilled, no prerequisite, not repeatable, or it is repeatable. Uh, you just gain three skill proficiencies with which you lack. Tavern Brawler. Uh, you gain enhanced unarmed strikes. So with the Tavern Brawler feat, you can just out of the gate with your background have enhanced unarmed strike where you get to do a D4 plus your strength modifier instead of the normal uh, damage of an unarmed strike. Whenever you roll damage, for an which means you get crits for your unarmed strike now, uh, when you roll a damage die for your unarmed strike, you can re-roll the die if it rolls a 1, have to use the new roll. When you hit a creature with an unarmed strike as part of the attack action on your turn, you can deal damage to the target and also push them five feet away. So you can shove and deal damage. And you can wield furniture as a weapon using the rules of the great club for small or medium furniture and the rules for a club for tiny furniture. So no more like improvised weapon proficiency, just, yeah, you can use furniture, just call it a great club or a club based on its size. Uh, tough, uh, first level, pre no prereq, non-repeatable. Uh, your hit point maximum increases by an amount equal to twice your character's level. Uh, when you gain this feat, whenever you gain a level thereafter, your hit point maximum increases by initial two. This is identical to the tough feat. Um, so I guess they're just trying to include 
all of I, I think these are the feats that are available with the backgrounds that they are providing and these might only be the feats that they want you to use because one thing they talked about as a design decision if you're gonna be using this playtest material but you want to bring in the other feats first level feats as you could tell because i just read all of them none of them ever give you the plus one to an ability score that's not a thing that first level feats will ever do because you're getting the feat when you're already getting a plus two and a plus one or three plus one so it would be overpowered to then gain an additional ability score benefit uh at first level when you're just putting stuff together so yeah Ooh, we've made it through the entire document back to the rules glossary my throat is rough uh so let me know what you all thought i gave kind of my commentary as i went through i am excited for this version of DD. i love the backgrounds and the design philosophy behind that i love making feats more important making them a more integral part of the game uh hopefully they can do it in such a way to where it doesn't suffer from bloat like pathfinder first edition or 3.5 where feats just became a, a bogged down experience let me know what you think about the critical hits though that's what i think is going to raise the ire of a lot of people is taking critical hits away from spellcasters and monsters um and and implementing the it's codified like d20s on every roll auto success once again the DM gets to dictate what success looks like, though, uh, especially for the more outlandish checks out there. Let me know what you thought down below. Be sure to like the video, subscribe to the channel. We're going to be covering one D&D as we get more information uh, as it comes out of the pipeline. So you're going to want to stick around, subscribe, and I'll be giving you my thoughts. And yeah, thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you next time.